Many of us have been emotionally moved by a piece of art. Now, what if we could harness that reaction and use art to change attitudes about climate change? Artist David Buckland thinks he can do just that and build the relationship between art and science to foster a cultural shift. And David Buckland joins us now for more. Nice to have you back in that chair. Steve, it's brilliant to be here and thank you for the invitation. No, 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 you were here several months ago and we're yeah. so glad to have you back. Great. Well, okay, the Carbon 14, Climate is Culture. You've got an exhibit and festival happening at the Royal Ontario yep. Museum. Tell us about it. It's, well, it opens. Actually, it just opens today, mm -hmm. so, uh, um, which is great. And you're around for a few months. And I'm around for a few months. It runs for four months. So, you know, it is a whole festival. It's not just the ROM. Um, but the major part of the show is at the ROM, and it's an interesting one and a very brave move by the museum because what we did was to sort of work with a whole load of artists and scientists and economics people something like you know two years ago. They've been since then crafting new pieces of art, so some of the art was, you know, they were finishing it the day the doors opened. So for a museum, they don't usually like that. They used to, you know, I know, like to know exactly what the thing looks like a year before they put it in. So it was very brave and they've been very exciting to work with. Where does the genesis from this come from? The genesis, the idea? Of the idea, yeah. It, uh, it's basically, it's a, Cape Farewell is the foundation I set up 12 years ago and we now have a North American Foundation, which is based here in Toronto. And the old idea was, you know, I was working with scientists 12, 14 years ago, and it was they, you know, they had something very important to say about climate change. But the problem was that the public, and they couldn't get in in the media, the public weren't listening. And a lot of it was to do with language. You know, they, they write very dense reports, it's data, it's not seductive to the public. So the idea was, could we put the artists, the writers, the filmmakers, the poets, the painters, put them on board, you know, in, in working with the scientists in the field, understand the science, and then find a completely different way, a different language about talking the issues that the scientists are trying to explain. It is fascinating how you've put this extremely eclectic group of people together, and we'll talk more about that yeah. in a second, but as the co-curator, you got to decide what went in, and you've got a piece here that I think we should start with. <laughs> yes. Uh, because it, uh, well, go ahead. It's fascinating. No, it, no it's partly because um, the whole project is artist led. So I'm an artist, I'm standing up there to be counted, I'm on the barricades. So I should have a piece of art in the, in the, in the show. Um, but it, what we did was to work with informers. So I worked with this guy, Canadian, called Tom Rand, who's an entrepreneur, but he's also kind of clean tech guy. And we were talking one night and sort of trying to understand each other's world. And he said, well, you know, if there was a price on carbon, you know, emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, then, you know, that would at least make people think about polluting, right? So that was it. So well, he was going, well, you know, what kind of price should it be? And he said, well, you know, so I said, well, you know, $200 a ton. And he said, yeah, that would be the silver bullet. That's the price they think. That would be the silver bullet. So then I was going, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So right here, here we have it. Here we have the silver bullet. And there it is. There you go, Steve. That, oh, my gosh, that's really heavy. <laughs> that is, you know, it's cast from a real bullet. I mean, God knows, I wouldn't like to stop that thing. Um, but that, that would do serious damage. That was that, uh, yeah. uh, the invention. But it is quite threatening in, in itself. But it actually weighs seven ounces. Now, the price of silver at the moment is pretty much between $20 and $30 an ounce. Huh. So the value of that, pure silver value of that is just $200. And so this is a metaphor for a bigger point that you're trying to make. Which is, put that as a price on carbon, and that's the idea. It, it could be strewn, I mean, everybody, oh, more taxes, more taxes. But if I also said to you, well, you know, just the, the government needs a tax pot. You know, if I reduced your income tax and put you tax on the carbon emissions, the government get the same amount of money, you, you kind of lose, you know, a little bit of money off your tax, income tax, that's great. And then you have a choice whether you pollute or not. You know, you can drive in a big car and you're going to have to pay a lot of tax on your carbon. Drive an electric car or bicycle, then you don't pay any tax. So that's the driver that would become. But it, it needs to be in that kind of range, which is a, you know, need, would need quite big leadership to kind of go, we're going to do this. We sit here talking in the middle of October. Yeah. It's 20 degrees outside. Uh, yeah. It is like Miami Beach, and I was going to say it's Miami Beach in the summertime. It's not quite that bad, but it but is unseasonably yeah. hot outside right now. And 
I need to kind of remind you, I guess, that we fought an election in this country about seven years ago on this very green shift that you're yeah. talking about, not necessarily taxing people more, yeah. just differently and on yeah. different things. Yeah. And the public overwhelmingly rejected it. Yeah, now, know. you can argue they rejected the messenger yeah. and not necessarily the message, yeah. but is that a problem for you? I think, well, and it becomes, you know, I, mean, I think it's a difficult one. I think people are beginning to realize that climate change does exist. You know, the scientists are absolutely clear about it. And I think the general public are beginning to notice. You, can, you know, playing hockey in, on, on a frozen park in Toronto is a fairly rare event, but it yeah. used to happen all, every winter going. Yeah. So they kind of wait me, you take away my hockey, then you kind of, well, that's, that's serious. So, <laughs> but, you know, there's another one is that, you know, the farmers, when you get big droughts or you get big floods, like in Calgary, mm -hmm. you know, that affects the price of crops. So it is beginning to act as, a, you know, as an impact. On the, on the value and the cost of things. Or the pests that were supposed to be uh, killed off by cold weather yeah, and now aren't uh, and are and, devastating and crops. And the forests or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, I think people are beginning to realize that it's a reality and that we sort of have to think about doing something about it. I should give you your silver bullet. I think about, yeah, I'm, I think I'm, we pointed away from each of us. <laughs> that's a, a good idea. Too. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of what we're trying to do at the wrong. Because it's first of all to say, you know, is there another way of talking to the public about this? And therefore, you know, that show will attract a lot of people. Come and engage. We're not trying to preach anything. We're just saying, look, this is the arguments. These are the visions of the artists. And that's what they've done, which is, you know, is a good thing. Um, and as you said, right at the top, you know, if you can take this to your heart instead of to the logic of things, you kind of go, well, wait a minute. You know, you're talking about your children's existence mm -hmm. and you know they're talking what 50 60 years the world could be in a pretty big bad mess and you know we all invest a lot of money and time and love into our children but we also have to think about well, what kind of world are they going to live in so you're trying to get us to have a, a, a bit of a different relationship with this issue than perhaps we've had heretofore and in doing so we're going to show image number two here the silver bullet having been number one Deborah Iglesias Rodriguez. Who is she? Pop star. No, she's not. She's the most famous. No, she's not. One of the best scientists I've ever worked with. Um, it's not a problem working with Deborah, which is very beautiful as well. Um, she's one of the top scientists working in England. Where's she from? Actually, Deborah Iglesias Rodriguez is from Spain, northern Spain, Andalusia. Um, but she has been in. England working with the National Oceanography Center and has now just moved to Santa Barbara as a full professor. And what's she doing? Her speciality is this little thing called a coccolithophore. Um, it's an amazing little beast, or actually it's a plant. Uh, it's four microns across, which is, you can't see it. You need an electron microscope to see it. What it does is it's extraordinary. It, it, in the summer, when the, as the temperature of the sea warms up, it makes a bloom of these little things you can't see, but it's a huge bloom, probably the size of Lake Ontario, huge amount. It, this little creature or this plant is actually absorbs pretty much over half of the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. It's more important than the Amazon rainforest. Hmm. And it's this funny little creature. We need it. Oh, most important little creature out. But what it does is, it, it, you know, it, it takes calcium carbon, I mean, it turns carbon dioxide into calcium carbonate through a biological process. And it, it, eventually what happens when it's in the calcium carbonate is basically a shell. So this little thing just creates this incredibly complex shell around itself, which is so beautiful. It's a sculpture in itself. Yeah. But you need the lateral microscope to see it, but you know, beautiful stru structure. And then when it dies, it just basically falls to the sea floor and dies as a shell. But what is extraordinary is that every chalk cliff you've ever walked on, it is 100% dead coccolithophores. 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 So mm -hmm. 10 centimeters of the top of a chalk cliff or in the middle of a chalk cliff represents something like 10,000 years of dead coccolithophores just mm. But it's a carbon sink. You know, they take in carbon dioxide, they turn it into calcium carbonate, they make chalk, which is completely inert, safest place to put carbon dioxide taking it out of the atmosphere. What's climate change doing to coccolithophores? Well, this is the, what Deborah's work is seriously about. And she looks at trying to understand as the oceans take, have to absorb more carbon dioxide, they're getting more acidic. 
in a relatively small term, but it's important for these little animals. How are they surviving as the, as the water temperatures rise and it becomes more acidic? And that's her big study. Um, it's interesting. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, it's like one of those things. What's the result? You know, you kind of go, Deborah, well, tell me the answer. And she says, well, another five years and I'll tell I'm you the answer. Out. But she is looking into it and she has noticed, quite, and she's become quite famous in, in kind of talking but about it. But she's doing the science and you're the artist. So where's the connection here? Here we go. Well, I've just told you about this lovely creature that looks like a piece of sculpture, and that's not Deborah. I mean, she looks like a piece of sculpture as well. <laughs> no, she came up to the Arctic twice with us. Um, we actually, Cape Farewell is quite famous, well, famous in coccolithophore worlds. We've actually found the most northerly coccolithophore ever existing on the planet at the 80th degree parallel north. Mm. And we, it was when Deborah was walking up there, we, we took water samples and found this little arse. We had a major exhibition in Paris, and it's like, you know, the story I've just given you is quite beautiful, but it gets more and more complicated the more you kind of keep scratching at it. So we had a big artwork, which I did, and I had a great big kind of sculpture, kind of like a chalk kind of floor with a cliff, blah, blah, blah. And then we had black walls all the way around the gallery. And I got her to write the science of her thinking on the walls with drawings and nothing, but she wrote in chalk. So she wrote in the subject of these poor little dead animals the story of the dead little animals. You know, it was really beautiful. Anyway, it was a very, very good collaboration between her trying to understand it. And I think it's also about. It's about, it, science is incredibly beautiful. You know, there's something about that whole process that we were trying to understand about these little animals or plants. And it's, 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 it's more magical. You know, there has a logic to it. I can explain the logic. But it, it, there's such a beauty about it. Mm. And I think that trying to understand the science, and I think this is what the audience got, you know, whoa, you know, this is, this is a magical, magical world we're entering. One of and the she also talks about the sex life of these guys, which is phenomenal. You had to bring sex in. I didn't thought you? I had to bring I sex in. Well, yeah. you know, I'm sorry. Apparently what happens is that they, this single, very simple cell just splits itself, splits itself. But when it eventually gets to the end of its life, and it's really under stress, and the food is running out, they start having sex together and actually multiplying hmm. that way for a very short period of time. There are many things I thought we might be talking about today, <laughs> but the sex life of coccolithophores was not on the list. But there you go. There you life go. is constantly surprising. Yeah, and science. You too. have received a lot of attention for an idea that you are also presenting in this show called The Trial of David Suzuki. Yes. Tell us about that. When we started off, again, two years back, we would... Instead of just talking to the scientists, we wanted to talk to the cultural informers. So, you know, we had an economist. And a lot of economists are right now deciding, well, you know, what is a sustainable economy? Do, can you have a flat economy? Can it, so we had somebody talking to the art group, to these incredible artists, mostly from Canada, some from the US, some from Mexico. Can you understand the, eco the economy? We had somebody talking from clean tech. Tom, I told you about him earlier. We also had somebody from eco-theology which is, again, you know, very interesting territory. Mm -hmm. I do nothing about that until we had this conversation. So all of these conversations were fed into um, the artists. And then they were asked, well, OK, you can carry on working with your, your specialist, but can you come up with a piece of art? What's happened is we've got the show at the ROM, but some of the people were trying to do theater work. Some of the people were trying to do music. So that, that wouldn't fit into the ROM. So therefore, we wanted to carry on. Laurie Brown. One, and there was a conversation about something else. But anyway, she said, well, you know, can we do a trial? Can we do a mock trial? And therefore, do we, and as a piece of theater. So, you know, could we get somebody, like, could we get David Suzuki and put him on trial and say, well, wait a minute, what you're saying, you know, if you wrote a manifesto, is that good or bad for Canadian thinking? Mm. And he would argue, no, it's a good thing. And other people would argue, no, it's a terrible, terrible disaster. So. That's what we've set up. We've set up a debate. It's going to be a trial. It's going to be at the ROM. It's going to be a 400-people audience. It's going to go out live on a web broadcast. But it's, you know, the, the big question is, you know, prosecution will try and really tear him apart. Well, that started defense. already. That started. And, and art yes. is nothing. It, it, art is not doing its job if it's not controversial. And you are controversial. And here's an example of why. This from Sun TV's Ezra Levant. Roll tape, please. Why was it chosen to have Suzuki under threat of jail? Because I've, I haven't heard anyone call for him to be prosecuted or jailed, but I've heard him call for 
politicians to be jailed, so why is he being posed as the victim in this exercise? He's basically part of a theater project that you have to understand this. I know, it's but it's theater. the opposite of and reality. And what is wonderful is that you're playing a brilliant role in this video thought. You've just played a, a role of an actor that we could have wished for. And what about the judge? Is she playing a role too? The judge is acting as a judge. Yeah. But, not she's, but she's not actually. She's Because she when she acts in a judge, she's in the real courthouse following real rules. Here she's participating in your propaganda exercise. Propaganda exercise. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that word. Oh, so we're not allowed to talk and make art about things that are controversial? You know, and it becomes instantly propaganda. I mean, this is a trial. It has a prosecution and a defense. Both sides slog it and out. We don't, you know, I personally think that the audience might decide, or the jury, that David Suzuki's guilty. I mean, we don't know which way this is going to go. Well, well, so that's not propaganda. We do know the judge, whom Ezra referred yeah, to, stepped, I mean, Harriet Sachs is a well-known judge in I Toronto, know. and she did step down from this because she thought, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm a real judge, and this is not a real trial, and I probably should recuse myself. I think it, the pressure mounted, and, it, and it's sad that that happened. I, I, I don't... You know, it gets back to the debate. Can a scientist who does all his fantastic work, and then can he go public with it? Hmm. Can, he, can he enter into making a piece of work like Deborah with me as an artist? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the same argument could be said and said, well, you can't do that. You know, you're a proper scientist. You've got to say as a proper scientist. Well, you, so, you, you know, have to admit, David, that, that, that these are strange bedfellows in some respect. I mean, artists. Scientists are supposed to be just the facts, ma'am, right? It's dragnet. It's just supposed to be very straight ahead. You know, two plus two is always going to equal four. Artists are exactly the opposite. It can be impressionistic. It can be here's what I feel. It can be, right? So we're not, sort of, it's very interesting. We were talking about Deborah again as an example. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, she doesn't, this is not fact. You know, it's like, how are these little animals coping with an over as, as the oceans get more acidic? Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, you know, 2000 and blah, 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 they're going to be all destroyed. You know, it's not a fact. It's actually trying to understand a living organism, pretty much like a human being, it's a living organism. But they, they deal in facts. They're well, trying to discover that, facts. They're trying artists to understand aren't. truth. Oh, well, well, artists are definitely trying to find the truth. <laughs> okay, but there's many truths for artists, and in science there's one truth. I'm That's fair to say. not that sure that science has actually come down to one truth. I think it's an evolving process, science. And, it, you know, Newton comes along with gravity, supersedes Copernicus' idea of why bodies are attracted. So truth got transferred into a better truth. I think the fact we're having a nice little argument about it, though, shows that this is effective. Your idea is well, you know, it's a it's useful a idea that's going to get yeah. people uh, interested and it, in this I issue. I do think that the port, I mean, I think the scientists. I think it's a misnomer that, you know, they they have they have to not say anything until they have absolute truth. And right. I don't. I think it's a, an evolving process being a scientist. No, that's a and fair point. And you step on the shoulders of giants. And you keep stepping on the shoulders of giants. And if you're really great, you become a giant well, yourself. Let me quote one of them here. This is one of the great artistic giants of our time, Albert Einstein, yes. who said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So how do you think that applies to the issue of climate change? Well. It's quite obvious, isn't it, in one sense? You know, can you, can you ask the same person who's making the damage to actually find the solution? Actually, you know, I, I oddly think you can. I mean, I think a lot of it is, I mean, one of the things I, I'm convinced, I'm pretty convinced that we're going to have to switch from a carbon economy into a solar economy, a you know, renewable economy mm -hmm. at some point. Um, the people who could leverage that change more than anything else, the, you know, the money that it would take, the investment that it would take, and if you had the kind of investment that the, the big oil companies are putting into the carbon, you know, discovering more and more you know, oil, if you put that into you know, renewables, it would happen. then it would happen and you would actually now, you would produce energy at the same cost, except it wouldn't have this legacy. Okay, last question here. We now know, I think it was the case as of about two or three years ago, that more people live in cities in this world than in yeah. rural areas. Yeah. Which means that they are not necessarily coming into contact with so-called nature as much yeah. as they used to. Yeah. And I wonder if that is a concern uh, for those of you who are trying to get us to think about our natural environment more. It's very interesting. If you're standing on a hill 20, you know, 100 miles from Toronto, then the air that you're breathing will be in Toronto probably within you know, five hours or six hours, depending on the wind speed. You know, the, the air 
is, you know, the air in China is going to come up to Canada in, well, you know, a week or so. So, you know, the cities have to be, you know, I mean, the biggest effect that we find in the cities is, you know, pollution, actually, smog levels, you know, those rise. You get a huge flood that affects Toronto recently. You know, so we're not, we can't escape Toronto, you know, the, the nature as we call it. Nature doesn't have to be just green fields. Mm. You know, nature is the, right in the middle of the city. Oddly enough, there's another wonderful piece of art in the exhibition is the bee populations are surviving better in the cities than mm. they are on the countryside because there's no pesticide. Interesting. So, you know, there are a lot of people who actually have bees in the cities. So how do you use your city? How do you think about your city? And how do you think about the air you breathe? And all of those things, they're all nature. You don't actually have to go and sit there and, you know, Canada is so famous for its beautiful, exquisite nature, but so are its cities are pretty good too. And most people like living in the city, so nature's there. Well, if they want to see what you're up to, they got to come to the city. They got to come to downtown Toronto. You are through February 2nd at the Royal Ontario Museum, the Carbon 14, Climate is Culture, the exhibit and the festival. David Buckland. Always good of you to visit us here at TVO. Thanks TV so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you again for the opportunity Thank to you. talk about this. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.